Welcome back to Unstable TV! And you should do Irish Couple Reacts! And do stay tuned because this happens every week! So if you're new here, don't forget to like, subscribe, comment and hit the bell notification so you don't miss any of these videos. And if you're a returning viewer, thank you! Thanks for joining us for another REACT! So Danielle, what are we reacting to on Unstable TV? So we are going to be taking a look at Korea Admiral Yi. This is part two. Be like a mountain. So make sure you're following the playlist. If you haven't seen part one, go back to the playlist and have a look at it now. And we'll see you back here. Let's go! We've passed the phase of Yi's life where his every effort is thwarted by the machinations of corrupt officials and jealous superiors. Finally, we can begin the story that sees Yi rise to be the national hero of Korea. But first, we have to talk about the two contrasting states that are about to meet in bloody battle. If you watched the Sengoku Jidai episodes, you'll remember that Japan had just come out of a hundred years of ceaseless war. Their entire society was built off of a martial hierarchy, where the most glorious thing a man could do was fight. Japan had fielded giant armies and had an economy devoted to war. They had hundreds of thousands of veteran soldiers and they had seasoned generals, battle-hardened from years of campaigning. And now, for the first time ever, all those forces were unified under one man, Toyotomi Hideyoshi. The Korean state had, by contrast, been mostly at peace for 200 years. The state oh, itself yeah. was a Confucian bureaucracy, which should have meant that it was an enlightened meritocracy, but in truth, the Korean government was rotten to its core, full of factional infighting and led by a king who perhaps might have been a great leader in times of peace, but was utterly unsuited for a state of war. <laughs> in terms of military thinking, the Japanese had spent years perfecting the art of war. The daimyos had become early adopters of the arquebus and had rapidly innovated on firearm manufacturing and tactics. They had created movable field works to protect their gunners, coordinated the use of spears and arquebusiers, drilled the men to release large simultaneous volleys to break up a charge, wow. and trained them to wait to fire until they were within an effective range. They were such enthusiastic adopters of the arquebus that when the Japanese eventually arrived on Korean shores, about a quarter of their total force would be armed with this fearsome weapon. The Japanese had also become masters of the siege after so many decades of having to topple the highly wrought, master-crafted Japanese castles of the Sengoku Age. The Koreans, on the other hand, had largely ignored the introduction of personal firearms and still relied mainly on the bow. But because the bow is a weapon that requires a great deal of training and the Korean military was in a dissipated state, the actual number of effective troops they could field with this weapon was now very limited. The lists of who they could call to military wow. service were all out That's of date, bad. and so the initial mustering of forces would lag behind, and Korean defensive works were mostly just simple stone walls atop hills or mountains. But the Koreans did have two advantages. Since the war that had been burning through Japan for the last hundred years was a civil war, and thus mostly land-based, Japan hadn't built up its navy nearly as much as their other armed forces. Additionally, while Japan produced vastly superior handguns, the Koreans had developed better naval cannons. And this all makes sense when you think about what both of these forces were <laughs> Japanese forces were used to fighting large, organized land armies, and so they'd focused on developing the weapons and techniques required to counter them. Whereas Korea had mostly dealt with pirates and raiders, so they'd built cannon to help defend their coast, and they'd built simple hill forts well, that so that when raiders sense. showed up, the people could hide in the forts and simply wait for the raiders to go away. <laughs> go away. Complex structures, because the enemy Korea usually faced wasn't an enemy bent on conquest. But that was about to change. Between 1587 and 1592, emissaries raced back and forth between Japan and Korea. Hideyoshi wanted the Koreans to just let him march his armies through their lands in order to attack his intended target, China. But besides the fact that letting giant foreign armies march across your country is generally a bad idea, the Koreans also happened to be tributary allies of the Chinese with strong cultural and economic ties, so letting this army march through uncontested was out of the question. This whole thing seemed like <laughs> the, clown. the idea that the Japanese would even ask for such a thing was unfathomable to many in court. At first, they assumed the request must be a bluff, maybe a negotiating tactic that would eventually end in the Japanese asking for trade concessions or tribute or something. But Ryu Song Yong saw further to what was really about to go down. And so he got Yi a naval appointment in the southwestern part of Korea and helped to make sure that he rose rapidly through the ranks, becoming the naval commander for the province by 1591. This is where Yi's story really begins. 
Upon taking command, Yi saw the dire straits the Navy was in and <laughs> knew he had little time. He began drilling his men and instilling in them the spirit they needed for the war to come. He commissioned a new type of ship, the famous turtle ship, which he helped design. It was a remarkable piece of naval technology with a spiked roof to keep enemy boarding parties out and a dragon head prow that could serve as a cannon or billow out noxious smoke. But even before the first of these ships could see active service, it happened. Sentries all across the southeast coast began to spot ships coming over the horizon. Then tens of ships. Then hundreds. This massive fleet flew no sails known to Korean arms. Fires were lit and word was spread. The Japanese were coming. But the local commanders refused to believe what they were seeing. They suggested that maybe it was a trade fleet or maybe even a large tribute mission from the Japanese to apologize for how rude their ambassadors had been. And so the local <laughs> commanders did nothing. The approaching ships began to dock at Busan. Soldiers, fully armored and prepared for war, began to disembark from the ships, and still the local commanders did nothing. By nightfall, 300 ships full of warriors had landed. A Japanese army was now in Korea. Finally, the commanders realized what had just happened, but by now it was far too late. With well over a hundred heavy Korean ships of war at the ready, they had just sat and watched this happen without even moving a single one of those ships out to scout the fleet. If they had, they would have found out that this was a Japanese commander acting against orders. Eager to be the first to Korea, he had sailed his fleet before their warship arrived. Turns out nearly all of those hundreds of ships were unarmed transports. No match for the Korean Navy which still sat anchored at port doing nothing. The Japanese ships <laughs> moved like lightning, smashing army after army, crushing all in their way. Within the month, the Japanese were already in Seoul, 200 miles inland. Korean resistance had collapsed. And as the Japanese had pushed inland and moved out of Busan, the local commanders had scuttled their fleets. A hundred Korean warships lost without a fight. But Busan's local commanders had sent word to Yi, asking for his help. So Yi set out with all 24 ships under his command, writing to other local commanders and telling them to rendezvous with him at sea. He left under cover of darkness and sailed through the night so his movements wouldn't be observed. By the time the various fleets met, they'd scraped together 45 warships and a handful wow. of commandeered fishing ships. But Yi, despite never having commanded a battle at sea before, had a plan. He would fall on the Japanese while they were in harbor during the chaos of a sack. He found 50 of their vessels tied up at Okpo and descended upon them. The Japanese were mostly away from their ships at the time, looting and slaughtering the population. The roar of cannon alerted them to their mistake. Yi and his fleet tore through the enemy ships, salvo after salvo ripping into the light wood of the Japanese vessels. The Japanese tried to mount a defense but to no avail. Soon, their men were throwing their weapons and armor overboard and trying to swim for the shore. By nightfall, 26 Japanese ships rested at the bottom of the harbor. Only wow. one Korean sailor was injured. Yi decided to disappear back into open water before his forces fell into the same trap he'd just sprung on his enemy. But as they sailed, one of his outlying ships spotted five more Japanese warships. Yi fell upon them with a vengeance. <laughs> Only one managed to escape. Then new reports came in of 13 more ships near <laughs> Japan. When the sailors on those ships saw Yi, they abandoned their vessels entirely and fled on foot into the mountains. Forty-three Japanese ships sunk, and Yi had not lost a single vessel. He was promoted to general command of the Southern Navy for his actions, but the sight of Japanese slaughtering civilians would stick with him forever and harden his resolve to defend the people of Korea. Join us next time as everyone else in Korea keeps losing, and Admiral Yi... <laughs> Wow. Also brilliant that uh, join us next time as they all keep losing and everyone will yee keeps winning. Wow. What did you think of that? The one beforehand is life was just really tragic. Yeah. And everybody just seems to be just having a plan for absolutely everything and just winning it all. Yee is literally like a minimum. Yeah. He's, like, he's ready for action. Even things he hasn't faced before, he's just ready to jump in and get into it. Boats? What's a boat? I'll tell you what a boat is. <laughs> <laughs> Yi has never been on a boat and just has this brilliant plan hatched. Um, just before we continue on, big share with the original content creator and thanks again to our suggester. We do appreciate this and we're loving this series. Thanks again. Yeah, absolutely. Just going back to where Yi came up with that ship, the turtle ship mm. for Navy. Like that is genius. That's that's a, that's up there with the Vikings naval. Like that is brilliant. How well he put that together. Like the spiked roof on top to stop boarding and then the dragon head like imagine that approaching your fleet in the night that frighten you that drive morale down quickly 
That was a nice addition. Where yeah. like the smoke comes out and that's where the cannon shoe went well. I like it. It was pretty tragic like in the fourth yeah. and this he's just like on top of his game. It's mm -hmm. like we're starting to see like real growth of him now. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, looking forward to seeing what episode three has to show. So we won't waste any more time and we'll see you over in the next one. We're gonna chop ourselves out of this. So as always, you are the beautiful people of YouTube and we have been on Stable TV. So drop a comment below and let us know what you thought of this reaction video. And if you have any suggestions for us to do, let us know too. And as always, we will see you in the next one.